And for this week's Binalo Talk, uh, is a friend of ours. We waited for uh, him to give a talk for a very long time. We wanted to in, to invite him for a very long time, and I think his talk will be interesting. But I will be assisted as uh, by as a co-host by my very good friend uh, and also a lecturer of ASP, Mr. Dante Manipon. Hi, everyone. Uh, good to see everyone here. Hi, Anna. Um, my pleasure. All right. And Dante, you'll be the one to introduce Akash, right? Yes, I'd be honored. Um, right. shall, we, shall we dive in? All right. Uh, before everything oh, else, before uh, I'll, just, I'll just announce that uh, Akash, can, is, are, can people ask questions in the middle of your lecture? So it's fine. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. All right. Okay. So may I call on Mr. Dante Manipon to please introduce our speaker for today? Yes, I'm very honored to. Um, yes, uh, our good speaker has um, let us know that we can ask during the ask questions and, and um, comment during the lecture, especially if it's about basic ideas in prehistory um, or concepts that, that are, not, are not clear. However, um, I think we are still okay for having questions even after the discussion uh, for more in-depth questions as well. So just a heads up. All right, uh, without further ado, it is my pleasure to to introduce um, a good friend of ours. I met Akash in, well, I've, I've been hearing a lot about him even before I met him. Uh, his reputation precedes, uh, precedes himself. Did I say that right? But I met him in 2018 in uh, IPPA in Vietnam. In fact, um, Dea and Akash invited me to their, to their session. And so it was a wonderful time and truly, we are very honored to have Akash here to, to speak to us. But before we have him speak to us, I would like to just like give a bit of a background. So Akash Srinivas is a UGC research fellow and PhD candidate at the Indian Institute of Science Education and Research, Mohali. Can everybody hear me? He is a prehistoric archaeologist, and his research interests primarily concerned with paleoanthropology, paleolithic archaeology, while incorporating a multidisciplinary approach, drawing upon all sorts of uh, disciplines. So we have archaeology, anthropology, geology, geography, geomorphology, and of course, lithic studies. Right now, he is currently engaged in the study of nature and variability of lithic techno complexes of the South Asian Lower Paleolithic. He has completed his master's in ancient Indian history, culture, and archaeology from Deccan College Postgraduate and Research Institute, Pune, and an Erasmus Mundus International Master's in Quaternary and Prehistory from a European consortium of institutions based in Italy, Spain, France, and Portugal. All right. His previous research has been concerned with prehistoric explorations and the analysis of stone tool assemblages from key lower Paleolithic sites such as Kinabanhali in South Karnataka, India, and Zernia Lapineta, Italy. He also engages in public archaeology and is a resource, resource person sorry, for the Public Archaeology Forum Chai with Prehistory. You can also catch him on uh, uh, Spotify because he is also the co-host of this podcast called Chipping Away. Uh, I've listened to a few episodes of that and it's, it's amazing. So please go check that out. Uh, without further ado, it is my greatest pleasure to introduce to you today, Akash. Akash, take it away. Thank you so much, both of you. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. So let's start off. 
So yeah, uh, is everything visible? Yes, okay. yeah, thank you. Yep, perfect, cool. So the topic for today's talk would be variability of mode two technology and how an investigation into this variability has implications for the Movius line uh, and Ashulian like uh, complexes in Southeast and Southeast Asia. So let's jump into it. So before we get in within lithic studies, you have a lot of different approaches. You have uh, people who focus on the shape or the form and the type of it. Then there are people who look at the technology related to lithic uh, production. There are reduction sequence analysis, there's functional analysis. There's all of these different kinds of lithic analysis and each has their own criteria for classification and technological attribution. The, Original concepts were based on form and shape and morphology, but with more recent developments and advances in the study, as well as allied sciences, uh, you have other classification criteria that come up. There's also individuals who use behavioral characteristics and parameters along with uh, technological and lithic parameters to uh, identify lithic techno complexes. So this is good in areas where you have good preservation of non-lithic elements, but when we look at it, uh, most of the Stone Age, I mean, the reason why it's called the Stone Age or the Paleolithic is because stone is what is primarily preserved. So at the end of the day, people fall back on stone tools. And this uh, somehow leads to either consciously or unconsciously uh, typological parameters or the shapes and type indexes being the uh, cause for a lot of these uh, technological and typological attributions. So with these changing time frames, so the first stone tools were probably recovered in the 1830s, 1840s. So until now, it's over 150 years. So through this time, you have a lot of different paradigms within paleolithic studies, within sciences in general. So and all of these uh, changes have introduced their own conceptions, own biases into the study. So we need to be careful and go back and reinvestigate a lot of the previous specimens. Uh, what happens when we fall back on simple typological parameters and type index specimen is that we underestimate the variability of the entire assemblage. So if you're just focusing on certain finish tools or certain specimen, the rest of the assemblage is uh, uh, relegated to the background. And this uh, kind of underestimates the variability within that assemblage in particular and the rest of the Paleolithic in general. So this kind of variability could be say, at an intra-site level or between sites uh, through space. So between say Europe and South Asia or Africa or different parts of Africa through time, because the Paleolithic as we know uh, is a period that is from 3.3 uh, million years all the way and stone tools continue all the way at least in South Asia to modern times. So this large time gap, you might have uh, time itself being a cause for this variability, the function of both the tools as well as the sites, and also the cultures and individuals responsible for this. We can deal with this in more detail at the end of the uh, talk. So a general introduction to stone tools uh, and the Paleolithic record in general. So the earliest record that we have so far is my, I hope my mouse is visible. If not, I'll just turn it into a pointer. Yeah is uh, about 3.3 million years ago at the site of Lomekwe. So here you have large stone tools that are mostly made from bipolar and annual percussion or annual on annual percussion. So this, after this, you have a gap of about say 600,000 years or something like that, wherein you have a continuous record starting from the older one. So this is kind of classified as mode one. And this slowly changes into what is known as the Acheulean in uh, Africa at 1.7 million years ago, which has these diagnostic shaped artifacts. Again, this is because uh, a lot of the original classification is based on type indexes, is why I'm showing these types. However, there's a lot more uh, behind the scenes data that goes into it. We'll look at the Indian data later on. So yeah, so this slowly moves about 400,000 years. You have the mode three, wherein you have prepared core technology, wherein flakes are the most important component uh, resulting in blade technology in the mode four, say about 60,000 years or a little bit earlier, say 17 South Africa, and finally microliths. 
So this is a general overview of uh, how uh, the techno complexes have changed through time. Uh, but let's focus uh, at this talk in the initial phases into the Paleolithic of East and Southeast Asia. The driving feature of most Paleolithic research in East and Southeast Asia has been, has, uh, been in regards to what is known as the Movius line. So the Movius line, uh, which was published in 1948, this date is important because this means that this was prior to when we have radiocarbon dates available or any further uh, uh, more recent uh, say innovations in dating technologies. So here we're looking at assemblages and collections that were primarily in a relativistic uh, dating complex. So to regard, so that's an important criterion that they're using relative dating methods or associated faunal remains for their ascription. So according to Movius, you have this line here, which separates mode two technology on the West with mode one technology on the East. Uh, again, in this map, you can see clearly that the Philippines is not even considered, which we know with more recent evidences that this possibilities of, you know, Paleolithic occupation going back to at least 700,000 years with uh, recent uh, finds in uh, Kalinga and Cagayan, in the Cagayan Valley. Also, later on you the possibility of uh, an entire uh, other world of hominin species with homo luzonensis so there's a lot of potential so it will be interesting to see how work in the near future will uh, also add to this uh, paradigm but currently according to what movius line says that you have this line uh, that you know splits mode 2 technology on the west and mode 1 technology on the east uh, india is uh, on the border of both. So that is why South Asia is an interesting area to work on this question. So let's move in. So uh, according later, I mean, after this and after Movius did his initial work, more work carried on later on has shown that you have an early Paleolithic complex that could be ascribed to what Movius considered mode one and a later Paleolithic complex, which could be possibly ascribed to the uh, homo sapiens so you have evidences of possible uh, archaic or archaic homo sapiens species going back at least to about 100000 years so you have according to a lot of authors you possibly have uh, this uh, dual uh, division of the paleolithic of east and southeast asia however uh, suddenly a lot of more two sites started appearing in this region in this region be it in Korean and the Imjin River Valley, in China as Jinshan, the Bose Valley, as well as in other parts of Southeast Asia, such as Indonesia, wherein you have uh, possibilities of mode two technologies that challenge the old paradigm of Mobius. Uh, another important question was the question of chronology, because a lot of sites that Mobius considered when they were subjected to dating has been shown to be of completely different time periods. So it's it's like comparing apples and oranges. I mean, they are fruits, but it's not the same. And again, the focus, as I said, has been based on morphology. So in this case, biphases. So the biphase, the morphology of the biphases distribution and frequency. So first, what they said is that you don't have Motu technology east of the line. Then they said, OK, you can have Motu technology, but it's not the same as a Shulian. So they try to classify it as a Shulian, a not a Shulian like and not a Shulian. And then later on, they said, OK, it could be a Shulian, but their distribution is very limited or the numbers are very limited. So basically, they're trying to, you know, post, uh, I mean, they're rationalizing post the fact to try and maintain the paradigm rather than, you know, as, uh, you know, acknowledge the fact that the paradigm can, is not something that we can consider in modern times. So what they do, what has happened is that now they've said that, okay, maybe the Mobius line is not something that is for mode, mode two and mode one, but maybe for mode three technologies. However, recent work has shown that maybe you have mode three technologies also in China. So maybe this will further push, you know, the move away from Mobius. And at the end of the day, the Mobius line is basically a, a remnant of a colonial legacy of prehistory. Uh, a lot of prehistoric theory and interpretation by virtue of its founding in Europe has a very, has a colonial uh, tint to it. Uh, 
you have this continuing in other regions, say Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, wherein some of the initial work was done by uh, European researchers or say American researchers, and only now are uh, you can, you're getting a subalternistic view to Paleolithic theory. So hopefully uh, this uh, perspective with an increased subaltern view as well as a non-colonial view and a local regional view, as well as an increased recognition of variability in the Paleolithic record will help us question a lot of our uh, colonial uh, legacy within the prehistoric times. So I say, as I said, uh, South Asia is situated in that boundary between what uh, is west of the Movius line and what is east of the Movius line. So this is, uh, where you know india and south asia comes into the picture currently we don't have any evidence of the lomequian i'm sorry this is supposed to be mode one i'm sorry for the mistake but yeah uh, but uh, even with the mode one we don't have any concrete dates so there are some claims of a couple of sites going back to 2.6 million years ago but it's problematic and what we are what we know for certain is a couple of sites in what is modern day Pakistan called Rivat and Pabi that goes back to about 2 million years. However, this is found in a surface context and the number of elements are, are few. So, I mean, uh, even though they're ascribed to being mode one, uh, a lot of the Paleolithic uh, researchers actually say that we have proper continuous occupation only from the mode two onwards. And that starts about 1.5 million years ago. We also have early dates for the mode three and the middle Paleolithic at around 385,000 years, which is somewhat contemporary to African dates, as is the Acheulean. So the 1.5 is the median age. So some of the dates could go lower. And uh, even for the lower upper Paleolithic, uh, it's about 44 to 48,000 years in South Asia. So a brief view of some of the sites. So Atirampakkam in Southern India, is the oldest site about 1.5 million years ago. And it also has the oldest date of about 385 for the Middle Paleolithic. So this is both the oldest Lower Paleolithic site as well as the oldest Middle Paleolithic site in South Asia. Uh, another site is Hunski Baichbal, that's in northern, in the central part of, uh, in the central part of Southern India. And this too has a date of over 1.2 million years ago. Uh, this site and this complex is important because uh, this the artifacts here are made from limestone. Uh, most of the lower Paleolithic record in South Asia is on quartzite because that is our most common uh, raw material. But you also have rock types that have been used, which are found wherever there is. So rock type is the type of rock that they find in the region is not a constraint on the lower Paleolithic populations or later populations. So here you have limestone at 1.2 million years. Then uh, in Didwana, which is in uh, Rajasthan, so the Thar Desert. So you have occupation of an arid region and a fossilized sand dune going back about 800,000 years ago. Uh, then you also have uh, cave sites and rock shelters that are occupied. So you have not just open air sites, but some cave sites, but this is very few. The nature of the Indian geology and the Indian geography means that you don't have a lot of cave sites. However, one of the cave sites is Bimbetka and it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site in terms of its rock art. However, it has an occupation from lower Paleolithic times onto more recent times and the rock art is primarily related to the upper Paleolithic period onwards. Uh, Another uh, region in Northern Karnataka has a large open air occupation over an entire region. And this is in regards to uh, colluvial deposits as well as associated with ferricretes. So implying that, you know, even through changing environmental conditions, you have a continuous occupation through time. Uh, the Narmada Valley is important because uh, one, it forms a kind of a passageway for Southern India from say the northern regions and outside india and plus this is the only region wherein we have some evidence of a, a pre-holocene or pre-upper pleistocene or pre-modern uh, homo sapien uh, archaeological i mean fossil record in the form of a cranium that is ascribed to homo homo 
we don't know it at, at a genus level but the cranium is uh, found in this region however it's in a secondary context so another site is in chirki which uh, has uh, basalt and dolerite as its raw material so this entire region has the deccan trap formation which is primarily basaltic and a lot of sites in this region show evidences on basalt you also have granite which is a very very hard and durable raw material and very hard to nap so in this entire region which is the ganga valley uh, rocks are very rare so wherever they found rock, any kind of rock they have nabbed it so in this case granite uh, so the middle stone valley also part of the gangetic plain has dates that are very late for the lower paleolithic so while most of the world has currently moved into a middle paleolithic par paradigm with more three technologies in this region you have dates of about 130000 120000 for the lower paleolithic or more two technologies dwalapuram is another site uh, it's a mode three site or under mode four site that has evidences of the toba tuff that shows the impact of the youngest toba eruption in uh, indonesia uh, we also have some evidences of engraved egg shells related to upper paleolithic from a site called patni that dates to 25000 years and another uh, cave complex that is occupied so you just have one cave complex here and another cave complex here and this one is a uh, karstic so limestone based and we have evidences of fire use and a lot of faunal evidence from here but this again is a uh, upper paleolithic occupation so for this study i am looking at three sites uh, mahadev pipriya kulikarar and kibban halli to look at the variability in their lithic complexes and how it and helps us answer this question so mahadev pipriya was discovered in 1961 uh during uh, professor uh, dr katri's uh, phd research work it's located in the central narmada valley in central india and it's an open air site in a uh, cemented gravel conglomerate on the left bank of the river so currently there are no dates available for the sites and what happened is that when the site was first uh, found uh, the professor the doctor identified something known as the mahadevian which is a techno complex which he ascribed as being equivalent to the older one of bed 1 and early bed 2 which we now know as developed older one or say an early form of mode 1 mode 2 so he said that uh, there was this kind of technology which grew into an indigenous uh, development for the ashulian in this region however his work was based on surface context and surface collections and not of excavation so later on there was excavation done by uh, dr supeker who said that it's a mixed assemblage based on uh, three different traditions the chopper chopping mode one assemblage a mode two and a mode three however this is problematic because this division is something that was imposed on the assemblage because it was all from the same context so uh, dr supeker said that the elements that are made on pebbles are uh, mode 0 or mode 1 the elements that are bifacial are mode 2 and the elements that are made on say siliceous material is mode 3 so this kind of typology was ascribed onto the uh, collection rather than coming from it so uh, another site that i'm looking at is pilikarar which is the earliest which is the richest known early ashulian site in the central narmada valley so this too is an open air site in a colluvial uh, conglomerate fan context there are no dates currently as well and artifacts are exposed in areas where the overlying fine sediments are eroded away that uh, expose the underlying paleolithic record uh, so lithic analysis has shown that this is a typical mode 2 techno complex so work from my own masters uh, 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 a dissertation and research project is being considered in this also and that's from the kibanhali paleozoic complex the site was discovered nearly 100 years ago and it's in uh, what is known as the mysore plateau in the southern deccan complex uh, this too is an open air site in a regu regolith colluvial context and this site is interesting because it falls on something known as the 13 degrees north water divide so there is no perennial source of water so that's that's an added uh, interesting component to how 
lower paleolithic occupations here in this region could have uh, coped with this environmental uh, criteria conditioning. So there are no dates. So as you see, we don't have a lot of dates for most of the Pilitic records. So that is something that we are currently working on and trying to refine. Uh, and as in the previous site, artifacts are exposed in areas wherein the overlying fine sediment is eroded away. So they are somewhat preserved in situ, but within the same area. And it is a typical mode two techno complex. So primarily I undertook lithic analysis of about 120 to 200 elements. So the reason for such low numbers for Mahade Pipriya is because uh, out of a possible 1300 elements that were from the excavations of Supekar uh, in, the, in the repository, only 120 could be recovered. So we don't know where the rest are. So we did augment it with some own uh, field collection, but they are not being considered in this study. However, uh, the interpretation from that is somewhat the same from what we get from this. So you could say that they are the same. Uh, so because this one has a mixed assemblage, I'll be looking at Pilikarar and Kibbanali, which are typical mode two sites as the control. So data was collected based on flick measurements, score measurements that are typically done. So about 50 parameters for flakes and 40 parameters for cores were considered and uh, various parameters for technological uh, analysis and chain operator analysis were undertaken that were defined by various uh, previous work. Uh, statistics is always important and necessary to understand. So a lot of statistical analysis was done and technological attribution was done not just based on the types, but on a whole list of parameters that are defined elsewhere. So at present, we don't have a list of parameters for South Asia. So hopefully my work at the end of my PhD would uh, come up with this list of parameters. So because we don't have that, I'm using uh, parameters that are uh, developed in Europe, the Middle East, as well as Africa. I didn't choose any particular region to have a regional bias. So we have three from Europe, uh, one from the Middle East and one from Africa. So, like I said, in Mahade Pipriya, the original collection is supposed to be about uh, 1300 plus artifacts, but only so much could be recovered from the different collections. Uh, so, you go back to the lithic archives for the original uh, data set. So, what we can see is that you have both uh, flakes as well as uh, chop, you know, as the diagnostic elements. So, you have an you have a lot of these, but you can see that there is a skew towards the uh, artifacts that are finished, which means that there was some kind of collection bias that was happening at the site itself. So that is something we need to be careful of. Uh, say distribution of other sites, as you can see, you have a more, uh, how would you say, a normal distribution wherein you have more flake and less finished tools as such. So that is seen also in the site of Kipanhali. So this is the numbers. I mean, we, you can go back to this if need be, but let's look at what the assemblages say. So the raw material for Mahade Pipriya is a coarse grain quartzite and from crypto crystalline silicates, which are locally available as water worn pebbles and cobbles in the river bank. That is where the site is located. So the primary blank morphology is pebbles, cobbles, and boulders derived from this uh, fluvial context. So their surface is patinated and there is evidence of rolling as expected from a uh, riverbank site. However, there's also evidence of, uh, you know, rolling is only on one side, not on the underside, which means that uh, probably they were left in situ and water action on top uh, rolled one aspect of one side of it and not the other side. You also have a few uh, fresh artifacts, which means that there is some component that is, uh, I mean, that is locally uh, manufactured and it's not all uh, secondary. So the composition includes coarse flakes, core tools, and bifaces with some smaller elements, implying that there is some fluvial activity and sorting, but it doesn't completely bias the archaeological record. So in terms of the techniques of percussion, we know of two. 
that is the direct handheld hard hammer percussion and the bipolar or anvil percussion. And uh, we note that there's at least three methods of flaking, that's the opportunistic, discoid, and the centripetal. Uh, the site is interesting because the bipolar and anvil percussion is used in two types. One, to open the cobble, as can be seen in uh, this uh, specimen. So this is the result of breaking the cobble from this direction. So that open the split the cobble that resulted in a planar surface from which flakes were napped. And in another form is that wherein the bipolar and anvil is used in the flaking process itself as seen in this core example. So you had this core that was placed on an anvil and smashed. So you have bipolar flaking flake removals that are taken from the surface. So you can see that the bipolar anvil is used in this site to meet certain uh, specific site related criterion that is the presence of these cobbles. At Pelikarar, the raw material is coarse in medium grain quartzite, which is again locally available. And here you find it in the form of the conglomerate fan deposit. So you have angular tabular clasps, as well as some uh, colluvial cobbles and boulders from the hills that are a result of exfoliation and flaking. So you have angular tabular clasps, and these uh, uh, surfaces are patinated with an evidence of abrasion, which means that they were exposed on the surface either uh, before their burial or post erosion. So there was some period of, uh, you know, uh, colluvial activity processes that are acting on th these assemblages. However, the composition is again coarse flakes, core tools and bifaces, which is not biased to any one type. And however, we have only one technique of percussion that is a direct hard hammer technique of percussion and uh, the three same methods of uh, flaking. At Kipanhali, the raw materials coarse and medium grain quartzite, which is locally available as classed in the colluvium, as well as colluvial cobbles, and uh, uh, from the exposed bedrock. So you have angular class cobbles and boulders. Uh, the surface is patinated with evidences of abrasion of weathering. Again, similar site formation processes to Pelikarar, wherein it was either exposed prior to burial or post burial. So there is some time lag between manufacture and burial or erosion and collection. So again, the sites, the composition is overall and with evidence of direct hard hammer percussion. However, here we also have evidence of the Kumbeva technique, which is when you take a flake and then flake the flake. So it's like flexception. So when we reconstruct the site, uh, the entire reduction sequence at Madhya Pipriya, you have the water wound pebbles and cobbles, which are either selected uh, with a natural breakage and a planar surface or intentionally broken by bipolar and anvil to get split cobbles, which serve as the cores. And these cores as are subjected to handled and bipolar and anvil percussion to get flakes. Some of these flakes are retouched or some of them are utilized without retouch. So a lot of the cobbles and the split cobbles are subjected to secondary working in the form of core tools. And some of them are subjected to bifacial shaping to get uh, bifacial elements of bifaces and cleavers. So as you can see, it's a continuous chain. So the cores could be uh, flaked as core tools, shaped as bifaces, or the flakes that you get are used. So it's a continuous chain. And some of the debitage and waste that was result from it was also utilized. In the case of Pilikarar and Kibanahali, you have the angular tabular casts as well as the cobbles which serve as the cores which are subject to direct percussion to get flakes, to get retouch. Some of them retouched, some of them utilized. Uh, however, the natural cobbles and uh, tabular cast itself are subjected to secondary working as core tools or subjected to bifacial flaking as bifaces. So when we look at it, overall the scheme is the same for both Madhya Pipriya, Tulikarar and Kibanali. However, at, Kib at Madhya Pipriya, because it's only cobbles, you have the added component of uh, bifacial of bipolar or anvil percussion, which is not seen in these other sites. So we can see that it's more or less the same schema in terms of the technology that is being followed, as again, some of the waste is utilized. So what we know from the lithic reduction sequence is that the local, the primarily local uh, raw material was used. 
there is either some selection for a class type so in the case of madhya pipriya it's the split cobbles or in the case of uh, the other sites it's the natural angular clasts or also in the case of kibanali some raw material texture and type so you have a lot of uh, quartzites available but only particular types of quartzites are used uh the bipolar and anvil in the case of madhya pipriya can be considered to be an innovative technological adaptation to deal with a region specific external impact factor in this case the presence of fluvial cobbles uh so the cores are op opportunistically exploited and also minimally exploited with a minimal sense of core preparation however there is evidence of core management strategies because of the uh, presence of discoid and centripetal cores uh the entire reduction sequence is geared towards uh, flake bank production with more exploited cores leading to smaller size flake blanks uh flakes are detached using multiple parallel strategies so in some cases at least three methods or in the case of kipanali four uh and at least two techniques in the case of madhya pipriya so there is secondary working of uh, flakes as well as on uh, as of flakes as cores so as core blanks for getting more flakes or as blanks for core tools uh, flake tools sorry uh there is evidence of shaping that is fasonage because of the presence of uh, bifaces and other core tools so what we see is that there's a fluidity between debitage and fasonage so some of the flakes that are recovered in the shaping process are used and uh, some of the flakes themselves are shaped so there is no distinction between uh, a reduction sequence for fasonage and a reduction sequence for debitage so there is this fluidity that we see in all three sites so to contrast it with a site in uh, east of the line i'm looking at uh, the site of dinshan uh, however i've not personally worked on this so it will be all derived from secondary published sources so this site was discovered in the 50s and it's located in uh, in the in the, in the fenhe garban in the eastern chinese lurs uh, plateau it too is an open air site in an aeolian deposit and it is uh, it has a what it's dated to between mi6 and 7 more recently however you also have some dates dating let's say that the lower late middle paleolithic in the middle pleistocene in this region so original uh, an ascription was uh, assigned as mode 1 however more recent reanalysis and uh, reworking with the change of the paradigm seems to be that it's a mode 2 techno complex there's also people who say this is a neolithic component the that's why you might have a mode 2 character characterization in this region so let's look at what's published so the raw material is a hornfels church limestone so there's a large variety of uh, uh, raw material but they're all locally available either in the nearby fluvial uh, areas or river gullies or as outcrops so the blank morphology primarily cobbles and boulders and the surface is patinated with some having abrasion and some showing water transport or immersion in water so again the composition scores flakes core tools by faces ferroids and chunks uh, there are uh, two methods two techniques that are noted direct handled and block on block uh, which is where anvil percussion is also known as wherein when you flake when you so usually when you use direct handheld you hold the hammer stone and flick the core but in block on block you are holding the core and the anvil is uh, the one that is not held so there are three methods that is opportunistic discoid and combeva noted in the archaeological sites so when we reconstruct the site you have cobbles and boulders which serve as cores then you have hard hammer percussion and block on block percussion to get flakes some of them are retouched and some of them are utilized you have same sequence you know the co the cores and cobbles or the class that are secondarily worked as core tools and some of which are subjected to bifacial flaking to get bifaces again some of the flake is utilized so as you can see the overall schema is the same as what we see in the motu sites in india so when we use the technological attribution of the different uh, Uh, lists that are known so in terms of the mosquera et al criterion it's the same so we, they're all mode 
Uh, if you look at Galotti et al., you have the same thing. You have centripetal discoidal exploitation, transformation of the original uh, blank matrix, uh, prepared striking platform, the long chain operator, retouch flakes, dominance of the direct handle percussion, which imply that it's mode two. So again, Barsky, you have the presence of innovative region specific technology. So in the case of uh, Made Pipria, it is uh, the use of the bipolar and anvil percussion. In the case of Pilikara and Kibanelli, it's the opportunistic exploitation of natural clasps. In the case of Jinshun, it is uh, the use of the block on block percussion technique. So you have large flip production, presence of LCTs, multifacial uh, and bifacial napping schemes, as well as discoidal napping schemes, the secondary use of flakes as cores and core tools, as well as, you know, so these makes it. Uh, realize that you know it has a mode to ascription based on their criteria so when we look at clack and clandice at all of these sites the pa the patterns are the same so mostly irregular plane striking platforms for flakes the cores are unidirectional bidirectional multidirectional unifacial centripetal and discoid so what is utilized or modified is cores fragments chunks and flakes shape tools are large cutting tools and large scrapers and the heavy duty component is picks round ended by faces, uh, core scrapers and choppers. And light duty is small scraper tools, uh, beaks or uh, notches, beak tools and denticulate morphotypes. So when you look at Shea and his large mode criterion, you see that the green is presence, the red is absence and the orange is doubtful. Like, it could be present, but it could be a component from a later time period. So you see it lines up more or less the same amongst all of these different uh, assemblages. So we can say that based on the criterion established by Shea, it's again mode two. So what we see is that there is definite presence of mode two technology beyond the line. Uh, so when we look at the large scheme of things within the mode two, you have a large amount of variability that includes mode one like assemblages with and without the presence of bifaces. So this is where we bring in intra-site variability. So there are sites in Europe such as Notar Kiriko or Kaone de la Rago, wherein certain uh, layers have bifaces, certain layers don't have bifaces, and the layer after that has bifaces. So if you're going strictly by the presence of bifaces, then you have mode two, mode one, mode two, which is not the same. Because when we look at the rest of the assemblage, it's the same. So we need to look at this assembly, uh, this variability at a site within the site level and amongst sites also. So my work at Isaniela Pineta showed that uh, in the region, you have other sites that have uh, of the same time period that are mode two. So when we look at the rest of the assemblage the cores flakes how they were napped the technological attributes the bio behavioral parameters it's the same only thing is that in uh, isernia until recently there were no bifaces during the course of my work i did find one bifacial element so that too is no longer the criterion to say that you know it's no longer mode two so in terms of space uh, you know, uh, sites in Africa, sites in the Middle East, sites in Europe, sites in South Asia, sites in Southeast Asia, just because they're far removed in space will have their own component of variability, either because raw material is different or the paleo environmental conditions are different. So all of these uh, spatial parameters will also affect variability and need to be considered. Uh, and when you're looking at space, we also need to look at time. At least in the case of mode two, we have a large time going from at least 1.7 million years ago to about 300, 400,000 years. So that's about a million years. So a lot can happen over a million years. So we need to uh, account for variability through time as in function. So function of the site, as Binford's work pointed out, you have hierarchy of sites and each site would have its own function. And the tools that have their own functions will be distributed differently in each of these sites. So the function of the tools will uh, will result in their differential distribution as well as the function of the sites will also account for some of this variability. And finally, and most importantly, is the cultural variability, be it at a cultural level of the group or at an individualistic level. So this is the most difficult to understand and comprehend. 
so before ascribing things automatically to culture we need to rule out all of these other parameters so what happened with movies is that he just drew the line and said there are two different cultural groups and the east of the line is a cultural backwaters so that is not something we need to jump on in the first go uh, following the scientific method and you know okum's razor what is the least and most least probable like what is the what is the least uh, what is the easiest exam reason for explaining something should be why it is so we need to follow these parameters before we ascribe to cultural reliability so if we do that then our ascription to culture would become strengthened so by taking into account a larger set of parameters for technological ascription and behavioral parameters it becomes more secure and also we need to clearly define a set of parameters of terms and terminologies because how we use terms in south asia will be different from how these same terms are used in europe or in africa or even in southeast asia so what i would be calling a biface or a hand axe could what somebody else calls a biface or a hand axe so we need to come together and you know set uh, different definitions for terms and terminology and another thing that a lot of people overlook is the role of site formation processes so site formation processes at a site bias the lithic record without us knowing so that bias as well as biases resulting from our own research methodology and collection practices will also bias the end result and our interpretations uh, and as i said over 150 years of work has been done so we need to revisit previous collections because if not they can't be actively included in contemporary discussions because the paradigms have changed what they consider what they called scrapers or flake tools is completely different from one what we do now so we need to update and redefine these uh, cultural terms and when we are redefining them we need to move beyond colonial perspectives as well as nationalistic perspectives so that is how i see we can probably supplement and complement future paleolithic research in the site so i would like to thank all of these individuals and uh, institutions for giving me access to collection as well as resources for the same and uh, all the organizers of the binalo talks uh, miss ara and miss anna for the invitation as well as my other friends and colleagues dante dea who have been instrumental in giving me this opportunity as well as been responsible for a lot of discussions through time that have shaped my perspective of the past so we can now get into these discussions as and when and it's open for questions yeah all right thank you akash for that very uh, good and very concise uh, talk i actually will admit that i don't know a lot about uh, stone tools but i have a question sure. you can put it on the chat or you can raise your hand there's a reaction button at the but at the bottom of your screen and i'll call you so you can after it but uh, are there plans for you were mentioning about the biases of collecting the the tools so and calling for uh studying them in the laboratory again but are there going to be new text on these sites that you um, okay i'm sorry i think or are there on observations on these sites anna i think your network is kaput so i couldn't hear half your question i'm so sorry yeah anna sorry i uh, it's a bit choppy on my end as well uh, no no worries it's really my internet uh, uh -huh. i'll em arab but uh, i think trish is uh, i'll just call trish balconic first she has a question okay, cool and so, in the meantime i guess you could type your question so we can get to that also yes 
Hi Akash. Hello everyone. Hey. Hello. Oh, so Hello. my question is just um, uh, I just wanted to make sure I understand this. Maybe you talk about the fluidity of lithic technology in that there is both fashionage and debitage in the assemblage. Mm. Hmm. Do you mean that they would like these artifacts would all appear in the same context, in the same layer? Okay. Yes, yes, and then, they're and it's in the like same layer. This all throughout the all throughout the deposit. Okay. Yes. So. Yeah. So that's the thing. So you uh, in some of the sites uh, we find this clear dichotomy. So uh, in some African sites as well as in one of the sites in India, uh, uh, certain raw material is used. Primarily for making bifaces, and other raw material is been used for, uh, uh, say, making flake tools. So yeah. you don't see that dichotomy in these sites. So and when you look at the rest of the entire assemblage as a whole, you you can't artificially break it down. We are imposing this classification on it. So there's this continuous chain. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No worries. Uh, well, I I think also. Um, that's pretty interesting because it doesn't seem like there's a limitation in terms of raw material, given that mm -hmm. they would do a lot of these things. But then also, um, like we observe Discord and SSDA also, which is, I don't know, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. All it shows is that, uh, I, mean, I mean, this shows that probably they're uh, both cognitively and dexterally capable to have a template which they can apply for any raw material, be it stone, and more recently, a lot of work is also coming up on bone. So uh, the recent uh, site, I think one of the collections that uh, last paper that came out a couple of uh, weeks ago is a bone and axe in uh, Central Africa, uh, the sites of uh, Castel do Guido in uh, Italy, all of these show that, you know, bone bifaces are made. So the template is removed from the uh, activity. So it's not just a dexterity-based thing. It's also a mental template concept behind okay. it. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. That's pretty insightful. Thank you. Hey, no problem. Thanks. Any other questions? Anybody? OK. All uh, right. Uh, from Dea. Hmm. You mentioned cultural variability. What is your take on the proposed dominance of lignic technology as a leading reason why Motu isn't as prevalent east of the movie scene? Well, that is uh, a reason that a lot of, uh, uh, say, authors and researchers say that may might not be Motu technology and they could just suffice with um, mode one technology added with the lignic element. However, uh, the lignic component would have been sustained from much before. So we know that prior to mode one, uh, before implying and making stone tools, when we look at the record of uh, studying uh, primates, they use a lot of organic material in, for their tools. So we could safely assume that some of the earliest tool technology was on organic material, be it wood, be it bone, be it antler, be it teeth, be it horn. And the problem is that they've not preserved in the archaeological record. So this uh, organic component has always been part of the lithic technology. So just because it exists already, that would not be a reason for uh, the lack of other technological parameters. So and so that's why I don't look at. I mean, I don't find it convincing that just because you have the possibility of the use of bamboo as a component for making tools, there won't be an added development of stone tool technology. Because the organic component has always been part of the archaeological record. It's just not preserved because of biases in preservation. So some of possibly the oldest tools that were ever made were organic. It just they don't preserve. I hope that answers deals with the question. Any other questions? I think Anna has a question. Does that clarify uh, your question, Dea? 
If uh, not, we can have a follow up question. So no worries. Yeah, I've, I've got I've got follow up uh, questions <laughs> uh, for for that as well. But yeah. um, first, let me let me let me bring out Anna's question. Yes. Uh, um. I think the question she was trying to ask earlier was mm -hmm. this. Uh, you mentioned cultural variability. What is your take on the proposed dominance of... Oh, no, wait, sorry. That's what that's, they that's they asked. <laughs> Dante. Oh, here we go. There uh, are new... It, are there new excavations on the sites um, that, that you were talking about? You mentioned that there are biases in collecting. So... Yes. Maybe are there any any anything actively done to overcome these biases so far? Yes, yes. So for example, at Madhya Pipriya, uh, the lab that I'm currently associated with, we've just recently undertaken an excavation uh, last year. So the lithics are being analyzed by one of my colleagues. So we can check that out when that comes to see. But as far as I know, uh, the reconstruction that I've made so far more or less gels with that. So there are uh, new excavations being done. So some of the other sites, hopefully in the long term, we'll get other people working on them to re restudy them. But currently that is one thing. And what can we do to deal with biases is uh, that's problematic because all research is biased. It's either consciously or unconsciously. So the best way to deal with that is to get multiple perspectives. So, you know, get multiple people, researchers to look and analyze it. And then maybe you can draw some consensus out of that because most biases will probably cancel each other out or, you know, get into detailed discussions about the same. I see, I see. Um, yeah, uh, it's been a while. Well, just a follow up uh, comment, I guess, on, on Deus question. I think um, it's not just so much the, I'm sure you're aware, the absence of uh, mode 2 analytics, but also maybe the um, the distribution of, of the regional and geographic distribution of bamboo itself as yeah. um, having something to do with coinciding with uh, east of the, the Movis line anyway. But I think, I, I know that's also very problematic because that, that's a whole new um discussion yeah. altogether uh purely yeah. environment and everything so yeah it's very complicated i suppose so i mean this is also interesting so when we look at uh, ethnographic uh, paradigm parallels so you have some distribution of bamboo in south asia as well so in groups uh, yeah. yeah in in ethnic groups that are associated with the use of bamboo uh the bamboo technology itself is uh is different so they use the bamboo, say, for containers, for structures, mm. uh, but not intentionally for making a lot of tools. Uh, because you need something stronger than bamboo to cut bamboo. True, true. So, and it also depends on the kind of processing. So if it's fresh bamboo, dry bamboo. So there's a lot of uh, complications that go into it. But however, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a possibility that, you know, their dependence on non-lithic components made that kind of technology, that realm of technology develop at a different pace. But when we look at more recent, uh, we look at the original analysis by Movius himself, as well as the fact that you're finding more work uh, coming up with a lot of possible mode two techno complexes, right, implies right. that this classification is artificial. So that's, that's one true. primary problem with Movius is that on a sites uh, east of the line, he looked at, uh, say, cave sites or, or uh, complexes such as the Hoabinian, which now we know is much later in time. Not, uh, see, the Hoabinian is about, what, late Pleistocene, but the Shulian is early Pleistocene and middle Pleistocene. And uh, say cave sites such as uh, Sakutian, the because of the fact that it's a cave site, its assemblage is different. So when you look at cave sites in uh, Europe itself, you have this kind of problem. So Kaune de la Rago, so some of the layers have no bifaces at all. 
so if he just had that occupation so he's comparing kaunidel arago and zakutian then the assemblage is the same when you look at the composition so it's about the paradigm of the time for falling back on bifaces and another reason also is that see, even when mary leaky made and clindized they described the developed older one so they have bifaces but it's below 40% so then you are artificially trying to rationalize this class di- distinction so you could have mode one with bifaces but because it's less than 40% it's developed older one and not mode two or not acheulean right yeah okay uh, there's another question what were these stone tools used for in those sites you discussed any uh, functional uh, currently insights? currently there is no functional analysis done but one of my colleagues is doing that so hopefully when his uh, thesis and his papers come out we'll know because a problem is that on a lot of uh, quad site is difficult to do use fair analysis so recently there has been a work work published Uh, from the team in epes on looking at uh, useware in quadsite so with that as a guide as well as some of our own uh, tools maybe we can do something in the near future but that's something that is still being developed and worked on and another reason is that a lot of the collections that i've analyzed uh, some of them tend to be from open air contexts so open air context colluvial contexts are not the best friend of for site of use for analysis cause you have a lot of trampling uh, colluvial action sheet flow uh, sediment load that damages the edges naturally and uh, oh. the quad site itself so for example when you take flakes out they automatically come out with a lot of edge damage so just the act of napping itself is introducing edge damage which uh, could be classified as use wear so that is something we need to further uh, analyze yeah okay any other questions from the from the audience okay uh we have we have a few more questions let me let me read them out to you so sure. let's start with first one asked you mentioned moving beyond a nationalistic driven rationalization um of lithic research in south asia can you elaborate more on this i didn't mean just uh, south asia i mean generally so what happens is that uh, currently uh, you have uh, see a lot of the teams that work in their respective countries are from their own countries so there is uh, an unconscious bias of trying to promote some sense of nationalism using the ancient past so the past has always been a tool to rationalize your nationalism so i mean i don't want to take examples discreetly but there are certain schools of thought that uh, say that you know there is an independent origin of culture and that can be traced to the paleolithic so and then they use their paleolithic record to justify that so these kinds of interpretations are problematic so that is what i meant that we need to move beyond nationalistic perspectives right uh i hope that answers your your question now uh, there's another question how do you address discrepancies found in morphological types within each mode okay uh so how i segregate or do my lithic analysis is very simple uh, i don't follow a strict uh, typology at all for me either it is a core or it is a flake so that's it because when you are a hammerstone so it is a percussor it's a core or a flake so when you do this everything falls into this so all your different uh, core types all your different flake shapes all your morphologies everything falls within one of these three technological components either it is a percussor used to take a flake out it is the core from which something is flaked out of or it is a or it is a flake and so then yeah so you either flake a flake you flake a core 
so it's all permutations of the same so when you fall back on these three basic classifications you can analyze all uh, lithic complexes without having the morphology come into the picture so for later on for say publication uh, for display you can you know assign whatever other nomenclature that is uh, followed but when you're doing the analysis you fall back on this you are not introducing these morphological biases into the study so that's how i overcome this and plus what happens is that lithic technology is accumulative is additive so you have mode 0 mode 1 adds into what is in mode 0 mode 2 adds to whatever is already in mode 1 that doesn't mean mode 1 disappears you have mode 1 plus elements that make it mode 2 you have mode 2 you have elements that make it mode 3 so you have some continuity throughout it's just that the proportions and their uh, distribution changes but there is this continuity so yeah all right uh, thank you there's another question uh, are mode 2 mostly observed on open sites hmm. if so is it possible that since most sites for example here in the philippines Our cave sites. Uh, wait, 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 am I reading this right? Sorry, I'm using my phone, so I'm. No worries. If if so, is it possible that since most sites, for example, here in the Philippines, are cave sites, uh, does that affect the kind of lithic technology that we have recovered? Yeah, this okay. is quite a thing in in the Philippines. Um, find like chopper heavier tools in the open mm. sites than small flakes uh, in the cave sites. Okay. Is that the same also? In, yeah. In... So for your for the second question, yes. simple answer is yes just because they are cave sites the kind of tools you find will be completely different from what you find in open air context sites uh the reason being that open air context sites uh have a lot more site formation processes that are acting either to accumulate or to remove and in cave sites you have this too but it's in a different form so they're expressed in different forms and two a lot of the elements that are uh, in and that enter into cave sites have to be anthropogenically entered or say in the case of i mean kalau is an exception because you have the uh, stream that brings in things so you that's why site formation process is important in that regard so if we can reconstruct site formation processes then we can understand what the reason for the distribution of the paleolithic record so right, right. yeah and two yes uh, from when we look at it generally uh, when we look at it from a level that is uh, beyond sites and regions and at a global level we see that a lot of the mode 2 sites are open air sites cave site occupation comes in later or it's a seasonal feature uh, in association with open air sites so in central india wherein we have cave some cave sites and rock shelter sites uh, when people did do this analysis of occupation they said that most of your op- op- open air occupation throughout the year has been open air only during certain times such as say the monsoons did people occupy caves as a form of shelter and when this also makes sense when we look at it uh, with regards to primates uh, they make nests they make they live in uh, different uh, trees forests so they also have an open air occupation so you could say that our early nature of occupation would have been primarily open air but because of a lot of say later on anthropogenic action because this open air site is what became cultivated first so the prolonged occupation of anthropogenic agency and human occupation has made their visibility reduced so that is why our uh, our idea of open air occupation is very limited and two for this again is because of the european heritage that we have in europe most of the sites that were originally studied analyzed and worked on were cave sites so that kind of intrinsic bias goes into the study which is what we need to overcome that's true that's true uh, any other questions from the audience all right um thank you yes yes uh, you. in the philippines the most of the the cave sites in archaeological cave sites are upland So there's mm. there's been this hypothesis um uh, about yeah differences differences subsistence strategies and also the seasonality as well. Yes. Um, so yeah, but 
it makes sense um, a lot of what you're saying. Uh, what would you, okay, I have a question if nobody has a question. What would you, um, what would you call this? Oof. Well, oof. it's probably, I mean, I would safely, if, it, if I can, if I can uh, find out proper flex cards, I would call it a core. Else it would be like some kind of utilized class. Would you consider it a mode one or? Ah, see, that's the thing. <laughs> we can't, you can't fall back on simple typological uh, parameters. That's where I'm trying to push forward is that just because of the presence or absence of certain types, we cannot say it's mode one, mode two, mode three. We need to one, uh, expand our technological criterion. So look at the entire assemblage, not just individual types and specimens. And two, augment it with behavioral parameters. So say uh, in the site that you found this, or if you made it yourself, was it the result of a local raw material acquisition? Was there long distance raw material transfer? Is it the result of a short reduction sequence? Is it the result of a long reduction sequence? Is there a use, uh, is there you know, evidence of uh, uh, reuse of the element? Is there secondary use of the flakes that has come out of it? So is, what is a component of retouch? Uh, is there an element of shaping? So we need to just expand and just not look at just one little element or a group of elements for technological attribution. Exactly, exactly. Um, I think your, your presentation really drove that, that point to it because I, I made this and honestly, I had no idea what, what, what I wanted <laughs> Like I wasn't thinking mode one, mode two at all. I yeah, I just went down the river sure. and I just was was banging on rocks. Exactly. And so that's why we should we should we sure. should really reevaluate why we give names to these things because yeah. human behavior is a lot more complicated than than these True. categories that we True. Set aside. And it is us who are adding this categorization. In the past, you know, the Paleolithic people. For them, it was a way of life. They were not thinking, oh, I'm making mode one. I'm making mode two. They're just making what they want, what they need. And it's an entire, it's, so it's a chain. So from mode zero to the present, it's a continuous chain. We are the ones who are breaking it up, saying that, okay, until this is mode one, until this is mode two, until this is mode three. So we are the ones who are artificially classifying it. And as Plato said, the very act of classification implies that there is a loss of information. Ah, very good. Very philosophical. <laughs> it is Plato well, after all. Going back to um, your Chain of Portois, the, the different mm -hmm. schemes of Chain of Portois that you yeah. that you showed us. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't I haven't like I, I haven't my, my my own experience is very limited in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. I've only been to a few uh, lit lithic sites with lithics on them, but I have not yet encountered um, like a, a full a full range of um, evidence showing depicting especially biface uh, mm -hmm. production so mm -hmm. I, most of the sites that I've been to it's mostly the flakes just the core mm -hmm. and flake yeah um, with that aspect probably there but maybe not in, enough to, to be as visible or or, mm -hmm. or detected okay just the so, so in that remark. case, you could, so that, that's also interesting because then you can, so with, by expanding your uh, criterion for comparison, so by just not focusing on the presence or absence of bifaces, mm -hmm. you could compare how these uh, flake sequences came out. So you have the cores, I'm assuming, at the site or in the region and the flakes. So you can look at and reconstruct how the flaking procedure itself was. Was it unidirectional? Was it bidirectional, multidirectional, discoidal, centripetal? And then by because we are expanding our criterion, you can compare them. So maybe they didn't have bifaces, probably because they didn't have uh, cobbles or tools or class that were large enough to make bifaces. But maybe they had that bifacial technology when they came into napping the uh, flakes. So maybe they were alternating, you know, use of the yeah. core platform. SS, yeah. SSDA means that you use one side and then you shift it. I'm talking about alternating, like how you would okay. when you'd make a biface. So you take out from see, one side, take out from the other side, take so, out from one side. So like 
one all around no, and then one flip. flip no one flip one flip. Uh, one flip one flip one flip like that yeah that would be uh, bifacial okay, okay. so if you find this kind of uh, reduction sequence in your course that means they have the conception of bifaciality maybe they didn't have an I expression see, of see. it but the conception is there i see i see so with Usually SSDA, when, when... what you have would be say you have it you exploit one surface then you exploit another surface another one, yeah yeah um we have mostly those although like it gets to a point where you're going to have to rotate it and then yeah so it. that's the thing so there they're rotating it because of uh, the fact that the so debitat surface of the striking platform is exploited i see so here you're oh. maintaining the striking platform and debitat surface by alternating it because when you when you take a flake out that flake negative itself becomes a uh, platform to take a flake out from the other side true true yeah i, so, yeah. I guess you can um okay um we're, we're oh, almost sorry. nearing 230 hello okay yeah oh uh, i just sorry. wanted to ask if um the method you were talking about is a method in itself as kina or is it something else the method as in i'm sorry iskina christina no kina kina okay no 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 kina yes, kino no. with no with kina would be different because uh, with kina you would have a, a a vertical platform so you're taking slits like this so you'll be breaking it like this so you flake this edge and then you flake this edge so it is the uh, association is a very uh, you know flat surface and uh, so you flake here and then you flake here so it's um, it's more of a cobble splitting kind of a technique and kina as far as i know is something that comes with the mod 3 cause that's where you have you know a shift from a uh, wall shift from you know exploiting the volume to you know sub parallel flake removals which we see with the levolva also coming up got it, got uh, it thanks yep okay it's almost 2:30 maybe we can entertain one more question we usually officially end at around 2:30 but okay. we will keep the room open for those who who want to stay and and maybe ask um some more questions if, if akash you are you yeah, are yeah definitely definitely okay, i'm time. always free yeah but yeah okay here we go um have you tried reconstructing the tools from from each mode i would also be very much interested to, to i will this. be doing that as part of my doctoral dissertation so the first phase of my uh, phd which i have just recently completed is the archaeological uh, sampling and data set so i have reconstructed the reduction sequences based from the archaeological record so the second part is i'm going to apply this on the local raw materials to see the variability of these different types so that will be part of phase 2 which will be something oh. i'll be doing in the next in the few months coming up so uh, yeah i wish i wish you luck on that um because thank you once we once we actually try and and, and break rocks there are a lot of you know unexpected yeah. uh, things exactly. that that we that we exactly. uh we might encounter just for the audience um i think i have some of some some of the things here that that were mentioned are uh, the raw material so This is, I think, some kind of silicified limestone. Well, this is quartzite. Um, yes. If you guys want, this is quartzite on the inside. This is quartzite on the outside. And, and then we have basalt. That's blackish, grayish. Yeah. And yeah, I think that's all I have. <laughs> I have this kind of uh, andesitical one. So just so the audience can see that that among the sites that Akash was talking about, there's there's a huge variability even. from selecting the different kinds of rock themselves so all of this also plays into yeah. how these rocks are being um broken up and true and made true. but one unifying factor is that they're all locally available there are no yes, yes. you know exotic like raw long, material right 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 yeah which you see later on so later on you have an introduction of uh, exotic raw material which means that you know there's a change either in the behavior or in the range that people covered so yes so these yes. behavioral parameters will also help augment your technological parameters i think uh, same here in the philippines mostly uh, we have a lot of 
so far that I've that I've that I've seen um, local local extraction of raw material until uh, later on. So yeah. like the, the obsidian later on comes from very far away. Uh, mm. It turns out but later on. Yeah. Okay. Um. Are there any other questions? Uh. From from the audience before we officially close. But again, if you'd like to if you'd like to stay. Okay, if not, um, I would like to say um, thank you very much, Akash. It has been a pleasure. I, I'm, I'm completely overwhelmed but by how clear the, the delivery was. I learned a lot and um, I was very pleased to, to be able to, to see like a, a huge, you covered a huge, uh, like, a, like a wide, wide area in, in India and, and give me like a, a glimpse into all the kinds of different different things going on um, in India. So hopefully we can talk about that uh, more in the future. Definitely. So without further ado, thank you again so much. Um, thank you for, thank you. for being here with us. Thank you for thank you. inviting me. Thank you for the opportunity. It was fun. Thank you so much. <laughs>